Our story begins with a legend. In the distant past, Hyrule was at peace. A people known as the Sheikah had developed technology so advanced that it was praised as the power of the gods. And with it, civilization thrived. Monsters feared to tread in a land under their protection. But the kingdom was cursed by a more sinister evil, the Calamity Ganon. This appears to be what has become of Ganondorf, Far from the prideful, Machiavellian ruler almost forgotten by history, the Calamity is monstrous, closer to a force of nature like an earthquake than a person. Throughout history it has appeared time and time again, always repelled by a princess who carries the blood of the goddess and a warrior wielding the soul of a hero. The ancient Sheikah were aware of Ganon's inevitable return, and that even their technological might could not stop him without a princess and a hero. So they devised a plan to support those destined to defend Hyrule and set a trap. Sheikah towers were constructed across Hyrule, designed to act as sensors to detect the calamity as soon as it appeared, and an army of technological super weapons were built to suppress it when it did. The Guardians were mobile, autonomous battle tanks, tough and agile with a powerful laser, but even they were dwarfed by the Divine Beasts. Truly monstrous mechs the size of castles, each operated by a single pilot. The Divine Beasts were closely connected to each of Hyrule's four main regions, and represented the people who lived there. Divine Beast Varuta was a giant mechanical elephant, named after a Zora princess from distant legend. Varmado was a bird, named for one of the Rito, Varudania a salamander, named for a Goron chief, and Varnaboris was built in the shape of a camel, named after a legendary Gerudo warrior. The names of those who piloted the beasts are lost, but their role in the upcoming battle was critical. Like the Guardians, the Divine Beasts each possess a powerful laser weapon specifically designed to damage the Calamity, but not to kill it. No, instead the Ancient Sheikah's autonomous army was designed to eliminate Ganon's minions and surround the beast, trapping it in a fight it couldn't win. And so, when Calamity struck, Hyrule was ready. In a battle so fierce it scarred the world itself, an unknown hero and the Princess of Hyrule sealed Ganon for 10,000 years. But the Sheikah were not rewarded for their efforts. The display of the godlike power they possessed terrified the king, and the saviors of Hyrule were banished by the throne they were sworn to defend. The guardians and the divine beasts were buried, and their builders were exiled by Hyrule's military. This betrayal tore the Sheikah in two. Most fled to their goddess, as they had done since time began, but others abandoned her entirely, the ancestors of those who would eventually form the Yiga clan. Though they had once wielded a power that won Hyrule a hundred centuries of peace, the Sheikah faded, settling into a rural way of life in the quiet Kakariko village. Calamity Ganon became a fairy tale, a boogeyman to scare children at night. Until, one day, he wasn't a story anymore. Breath of the Wild is set a century after an apocalypse. Before Link even opens his eyes, Hyrule is in ruins. Because a hundred years before the game, Ganon returned. This ancient nightmare tore itself out of the pages of storybooks and was born into Hyrule once again, just as he had been 10,000 years before. But this time, the kingdom failed to stop him. Despite years of preparation, a thriving, prosperous country crumbled in a single night. Its armies were shattered, its people slaughtered, 
and hope was all but extinguished. Link explores the broken carcass of the Kingdom of Hyrule, the last light that remains in the darkness. Breath of the Wild is about uncovering the story of Hyrule's fall, and finding the courage to save it. Tears of the Kingdom releases on the 12th of May 2023, taking Link to the skies above, and the caves below, the Kingdom of Hyrule. As of the time this video releases, we know very little about the story this game will tell, but it's one of very few direct sequels in the Zelda series. Tears of the Kingdom takes place directly after Breath of the Wild, in the same world, with many of the same characters. So, since it's been six years since we first set foot in this new world of Zelda, let's take some time to recap the lore and events of Breath of the Wild, which set the scene for what looks to be Link's greatest adventure yet. A century before Link awakens in the Shrine of Resurrection, Hyrule was a beautiful country of green fields and rolling hills, natural wonders like the fiery Death Mountain and mighty Hebra Peak. The country was defended by a powerful alliance of intelligent, civilized races, the Gerudo in the desert to the southwest, and the Zoras in their domain in the east the Gorons of Death Mountain, and the Rito in the shadow of the Hebra mountain range. And most of all, the Hylians, who have lived all across the country since before recorded history, in anything from tiny hamlets to the thriving Castle Town, a bustling market in the shadow of the kingdom's most important symbol, Hyrule Castle itself. The seat of the royal family is an ancient citadel somewhere between a palace, a cathedral, and a fortress in the very heart of the realm. As far as we know, this Hyrule is the very same kingdom from the older Zelda games, just far, far into the future. By this point, so much time has passed since any of the previous Zelda games that it isn't clear what timeline it takes place in. The time-travelling hero of Ocarina of Time causes the Zelda timeline to split into three different sequences of games, three alternate paths of history with their own Zelda games taking place in them. But even Breath of the Wild's ancient history takes place thousands of years after the latest games in the original timelines. Anything and everything that came before this is consigned to what is known as the Era of Myth the only remaining knowledge of Hyrule's nebulous history. Before the Great Calamity, King Rome Bosphoramus Hyrule ruled from the castle, along with his wife, the Queen. They had one daughter, Princess Zelda, named in the tradition of the royal family, whose ancestry traces back to the reincarnation of the goddess. When Zelda was six years old, however, tragedy struck the queen died suddenly, leaving the princess without a mother and without a mentor. She is the inheritress of a mystical, divine power, but has nobody to guide her towards awakening it. Despite Hyrule's princess being, in spirit, the descendant of Hylia, there appears to have been a resurgence of faith in the goddess herself as a separate deity sometime before Breath of the Wild. Ancient statues of the goddess are found all across the kingdom, and the ancient Sheikah who helped defeat Ganon 10,000 years before did so in her name, claiming to be blessed with her clairvoyance. Their descendants, the modern Sheikah, lived in their quiet village in the Nekluda region. Most kept to themselves, though some served the king, like Impa, a royal advisor. The mysterious ancient Chica were gone, but their works remained. Peculiar structures called shrines could still be found across the kingdom, though they lay dormant, with their doors firmly locked, silent relics from a bygone era. 
Even older ruins were scattered in the corners of the world, all that remained of a magical civilization called the Zonai. These people vanished mysteriously thousands of years ago, for an unknown reason, but their architecture, trademarked by spiral patterns and stone dragon heads, was found all across the kingdom. Hyrule's current civilizations had enjoyed a long age of peace, working and trading with each other, all unified under the divine rulership of the royal family. But this peace wouldn't last. Hyrule was shaken by a prophecy. A fortune teller close to the royal family laid out a grim warning that the signs of a resurrection of Calamity Ganon were clear. But the prophecy also gave a clue on how to defeat it, that the answer lay hidden beneath the ground. King Rome wasted no time in mobilizing the kingdom. Teams of researchers and workmen began searching the land for the Sheikah's forgotten engines. But this was no easy task. The ancient King of Hyrule had abolished their technology and research, and the whereabouts of the machines had passed from memory into myth, then faded altogether. A dedicated research institute was founded under the control of the castle, spearheaded by the Sheikah scientists Pura and Robbie. Though their ancestors had been banished by the old king, the looming return of the Calamity was enough for Rome to forget this, and rely on the Sheikah's arcane knowledge once more. Their tribe had kept secret records of the locations of two of the divine beasts, Varuta in Zora's domain, and Varnaboris near the desert. The two divine beasts were found and excavated, Colossal war engines built in the distant past to suppress a threat that, until recently, was thought to be little more than a legend. And before long, the remaining beasts were found and unearthed, Varudania on Death Mountain and Varmedo found in the Hebra region. Alongside them, the researchers found the Guardians, mobile, autonomous soldiers built to defend Hyrule armoured in thick, protective plating, and armed with deadly laser beams. Each discovery was of a weapon of unimaginable scale and power, which brought the kingdom hope, but with each new find, a terrible dread began to set in. The Sheikah machines were real, tangible things, not just stories, and so Calamity Ganon was real too. The battle 10,000 years ago had really happened, and now the kingdom was about to be faced with the same threat. Alongside the excavations, King Rome also focused on his daughter, Zelda. Her grandmother was able to hear voices from the spirit realm, and her late mother had promised that, one day, her own power would awaken within Zelda too. The king knew that, faced with the return of Ganon, Hyrule's princess would be its greatest weapon. Zelda herself, though, developed a passion for researching the magical technology of the ancient Sheikah. She took part in the long, arduous process of attempting to uncover these lost relics, and helped with some important breakthroughs. Together with Pura, Zelda discovered the Sheikah Slate, an ancient tablet used to control and interact with the advanced technology. The Sheikah Slate was crucial. It allowed the research teams to activate the Divine Beast's terminals and bring them back to life. And at Hyrule Castle, Robbie was able to activate the Guardians, restoring them to a fully operational state as defensive weapons. Zelda also helped to discover the Shrine of Resurrection, an ancient underground medical facility located on the Great Plateau. Together with Pura, she was able to restore it to working order, though she hoped its use would never be necessary. However, there remained an unsolved mystery. The ancient records mentioned a greater number of guardians, and guardians of different types, stored in five giant columns somewhere below Hyrule Castle. But despite exhaustive excavations below the surface, the columns and their caches of guardians could not be found. The divine beasts were active, 
but unlike the Guardians, they required pilots. The ancient legend described these as mighty warriors from across the kingdom, so Zelda set out to appoint their successors. To pilot Varudania, she selected the mighty Goron chief, Daruk. For Varuta, she chose the Zora princess, Mipha, and for Vanaboris, the Gerudo chief, Urbosa. Varmedo was to be the weapon of Rivali of the Rito, the most skilled archer in the kingdom. These four individuals were declared champions, and they had a sacred purpose and duty to Hyrule. But there was also a fifth, Hylian champion, Link. Link was the son of a Hylian knight and an unknown mother. He possessed an incredible talent for swordsmanship. At as young as four years old, he was able to best some adults in training. It's no surprise that, in his early teenage years, he was able to pull the Master Sword from its pedestal, the sacred sword that seals the darkness, a blade that can only be wielded by one with the soul of a hero. With this blade in hand, Link proved himself to be a warrior without equal. With ease, he slayed a Lynel that was terrorizing Zora's domain, and defeated a malfunctioning Guardian by grabbing a nearby pot lid and reflecting the laser beam back into its eye. Urbosa was not only the chief of the Gerudo tribe, a race of warrior women hailing from the desert, she had been a close friend of the Queen, Zelda's mother. Zelda and Urbosa share the grief of her loss, and the Gerudo becomes especially protective of the princess, her little bird. Daruk was a gentle giant, a hulking Goron who possessed incredible strength, but had a kind, honourable temperament, a characteristic he shared with the majority of the tribe he led. Rivali, on the other hand, was arrogant and cocky. He was a truly singular archer, with complete mastery over his bow, and the ability to control the wind around him. He felt that his pride was wounded by the appointment of Link, that he is the superior warrior, and that, given the opportunity, he would have been able to defeat Ganon by himself. Mipha was the daughter of the Zora King Darifan, and was heir to their throne, ahead of her younger brother, Prince Sidon. She was naturally gifted at spear fighting. She wielded the light scale trident, a weapon crafted for her when she was born with exceptional skill. But she was also skilled with magic and had the ability to heal wounds. Over the years, Mipha developed an affection for Link. She made him a set of armor, which in Zora culture is part of a royal marriage proposal. But Link was appointed not only as the Hylian champion, but as Zelda's chosen knight, a personal bodyguard for the princess, tasked with defending her life with his own. Mipha grows jealous of Zelda, who spends all her time with Link. He had no divine beast to call his own, but Link's role was even more important than those of the other champions. Just like the legendary hero from 10,000 years ago, Link was tasked with defeating and sealing the Calamity Ganon when it appeared. But the ancient legend showed that the champions and the hero were worthless without the sacred powers of the kingdom's princess. Zelda had been training to awaken her latent powers since the year after her mother passed, when she was only seven years old. And now, with the Calamity's prophesied return looming over her, she became more frustrated and more terrified that her powers would not awaken. No matter how much she prayed, she could not hear the voices from the spirit realm. She traveled to the springs of power and courage, holy shrines devoted to the goddess, to no avail. This failure tortured Zelda, she felt that she had the weight of her kingdom on her shoulders, but that she lacked the strength to defend it. This was exacerbated by Link, a silent knight who, to Zelda, seemed effortlessly brilliant. The princess projected her own insecurities onto Link, and began to think that he judged her for her failures. This was until one day when Zelda travelled to the Gerudo Desert, and was ambushed by assassins from the Yiga clan. 
These twisted Chica are what became of those who forsook the goddess Hylia 10,000 years ago, when their technology was stripped from them by the king. The group lived in exile, and when Ganon's return was foretold, pledged allegiance not to Hyrule, but to the Calamity. So, when Zelda was faced with the cruel blades of Yiger assassins, she knew that it was the end. Surrounded and outnumbered, Zelda closed her eyes to meet her fate, but was saved by Link, who appeared as if from nowhere, Master Sword in hand. Something awoke in Zelda in this moment, an affection for her silent guardian. And from here, the bond between the pair only grew stronger as they continued to journey together. On her 17th birthday, Zelda, together with her chosen knight, travelled to the third and final Sacred Spring, the Spring of Wisdom on Mount Laneru, her last chance to awaken her sealing powers. But just like before, she left the spring the same as she had arrived. At the Laneru Promenade, the champions consoled Zelda. Urbosa assured her that the Spring of Wisdom was not their final hope, that somehow they would find the trigger to unlock her powers. Mifa began to explain how, when she uses her healing magic, she thinks of something in particular to focus her strength. But just before she finished her sentence, the earth shook. Rivali jumped into the sky and looked to Hyrule Castle. The Calamity had awoken. Without delay, the champions leapt into action. Daruk, Urbosa, and Mifa split off to travel to their divine beasts, while Rivali was able to fly straight towards Varmado. Zelda and Link instead headed directly for the castle, where Ganon had appeared. This was to be a unified assault. The divine beasts were to provide support for the princess and the hero at the castle. But when the champions arrived at the beasts, to their horror, they weren't alone. Ganon, having been defeated by Sheikah Machines 10,000 years ago, had hatched a plan. Though the Calamity was akin to a thundering storm of malice, it was cunning. When it appeared, it sent forth missiles of its terrible power to each of the Divine Beasts concentrated malice that formed phantom versions of the Calamity itself. To proceed with their plan and support Link and Zelda, the champions were faced with an impossible task, to wrest control of their beasts from the clutches of the Blight Ganons. These were horrific splicings of malice and Sheikah technology, formed into twisted mockeries of the champions, designed to kill their targets and occupy the beasts. And though the champions represented the mightiest of Hyrule's warriors, the most powerful, gifted individuals from each of the country's tribes, they fell. Trapped in their divine beasts, terrified and alone, each champion was slaughtered by their blight and one by one, their gigantic war engines fell under Ganon's control. But Ganon had emerged from deep below Hyrule Castle. Its halls were choked with a dark fog, and malice swirled around its towers. The castle was the centre for Guardian research. Almost every one of the excavated machines were situated there, in the heart of the kingdom, ready to defend it from danger but not from this. Teams of researchers could only watch, horrified, as the Guardians were poisoned, as Malice overrode their programming and turned them into killing machines. In a heartbeat, the castle turned from the most secure fortress in the kingdom into a slaughterhouse. Guardians, now each possessing a sliver of Ganon's consciousness, stormed through the halls and out into the town, obliterating anything and anyone who stood against them. Five giant columns, the columns that Zelda and the researchers had searched for, burst from deep below the ground, each burning with the bright purple of malice. 
From them, hundreds upon hundreds more Guardians crawled out into Hyrule, each of them an unstoppable battle tank under the Calamity's control. At some point, soon after Ganon's return, King Rome was killed. The castle fell, its town burned, and the kingdom's people scattered. The castle's soldiers, completely outmatched and terrified, fled east with one thing in mind. One thing that could save them from this godlike, invincible army of machines, the impenetrable fortress of Akala Citadel. Those that made it began preparing for siege, manning the cannons and lining archers along the walls. For the soldiers who had lost everything in the fall of Hyrule Castle, the Akala Fortress was their last hope. At the garrisons in Hyrule Field, the soldiers stationed there noticed the glow from the burning ruins of Castletown, heard the screams of the massacred, and they, too, prepared for battle. From both Hyrule Garrison and Colomo Garrison, these soldiers moved south, gathering civilians from smaller settlements like the Exchange and Gatepost Town, before fleeing eastwards towards the Dueling Peaks. With Hyrule Field aflame behind them, the soldiers reached the mountains with the surviving civilians. But they weren't safe yet. The Guardians were moving south rapidly from the castle, bringing with them devastation on an unimaginable scale. The garrisons and towns were stomped into the dirt, and anyone still left in the field crushed or burned to death. The soldiers continued east, through the open Blatchery Plain, towards Fort Hateno. Once they reached the fortress, exhausted and terrified, they readied themselves for battle. Those who could not fight continued past the fort towards Hateno village, and anyone that could hold a bow was stationed along the wall of the fort. The portcullis was lowered, and the soldiers waited, weary, cold and frightened, praying to the goddess Hylia for help. North of here, at Akala Citadel, an army of broken, terrified soldiers did the same. Until, finally, purple lights emerged from the fog. Cannons were aimed, bows drawn, fear swallowed as the technological terrors advanced on the fortress. Details of the ensuing battle have been lost to time, but the outcome is clear. Despite the soldiers being fortified in the mighty citadel, this was one of the most tragic massacres Hyrule has ever seen. Though the last Knights of Hyrule fought in the battle at Akala Citadel, their efforts to defend themselves against the endless hordes of machines were, ultimately, in vain. The fortress was designed, and the soldiers trained, to defend against monsters or people, and so the might and sheer number of the Guardians overwhelmed them. With the deaths of the last men, the strength of their kingdom fell with them, crushed into the dirt by the many shunting legs of corrupted Sheikah Titans. But for the soldiers at Fort Hateno, help was coming. When the champions moved to their Divine Beasts, Link and Zelda had headed to the castle, in an attempt to destroy Calamity Ganon. But when the Guardians were turned and the Divine Beasts corrupted, the champions killed, the pair were forced to flee. They ran for the safety of Kakariko Village, with hundreds of guardians on their tail. With them, they guided any survivors left after the massacre at the capital. Link and Zelda ran south through Hyrule Fields, using the thick forests along the river as cover. As they fled, the guardians hounded them, yet the hero destroyed them one by one. With the power of the Master Sword, Link broke the thick armor of the machines and ripped Ganon's malice from them. Night fell, and the rain began to pour, and still the champion and the princess ran. The horrific outcome of the Great Calamity was starting to take its toll on Zelda, who collapsed into tears, blaming the kingdom's fall on herself. Exhausted, Link helped her to her feet and continued onwards towards Kakariko, where the princess might be safe in the hands of the Sheikah. The two finally passed through the dueling peaks into Blatchery Plain, but the hero's strength was beginning to dwindle. In close pursuit was a horde of guardians, swarming behind them like locusts. 
Cruel purple lights lit up the night as the machines began swarming into the field from the dueling peaks, Ganon's malice burning from within them like a furnace. Although the thin pass through the mountains had bottlenecked them, they still poured into the plain en masse, spreading out and advancing on Fort Hateno. The war engines got closer and closer to the defending wall, blinding bursts of blue light erupting from them, their lasers tearing through stone like it were paper, vaporizing soldiers instantly. As men died on the front lines, more climbed to replace them, picking up their bows and continuing the return fire on the guardians. Meanwhile, in the field, Link fought alone. The hero battled guardian after guardian, forging a path towards Kakariko. From the fort, the soldiers could see the warrior far out in the field, taking the fight to the ancient automata, a warrior of legend single-handedly bearing the brunt of the guardian assault. But for every machine he destroyed, ten more appeared. By this point, the ancient master sword was chipped and broken. His champion's tunic burned and frayed from near misses with the Guardian's powerful lasers. And at Ash Swamp, Link finally collapsed. He was mortally wounded from countless skirmishes with the war engines, and heavily fatigued from travelling across Hyrule. The hero fell, resting on his sword, but the Guardians do not tire. A Sheikah machine appeared before him, and with the last of his strength, he stood and shielded Zelda with his body. But something inside the princess stirred. If the Calamity's Awakening hadn't cut her off, Mifa would have said that she thinks of her love for Link when she uses her healing powers. And right then, in the moment where her invincible hero finally falters, her love for him awakens the goddess within. In the darkest night, in the middle of the most tragic battle the kingdom had ever seen, Zelda stepped out in front of the Guardian. Throwing Link behind her, she raised her hand. Hers was the power of the ancient goddess, and it tore Ganon's malice out from the heart of the machine, extinguishing it and leaving behind an empty husk. Her power exploded across the field, a tidal wave of sacred energy that broke the hold Ganon had on the Guardians. Every one of the ancient machines fell, one by one, the hatred that fueled them vanquished. The Guardians climbing the fort, seconds from overrunning and slaughtering its people, ceased to function, the lights from within fading to darkness. The dust settled on a silent field. While mere moments ago the turf was being torn up by the shunting legs of the Guardians, their empty shells now littered the fields, unmoving and cold like great tombstones. The battle of Fort Hateno was over. The people who had made it past the walls were safe, for now, but at a terrible cost. Link collapsed into Zelda's arms, the hero dies. Zelda weeps, her heart broken, until a voice speaks from within the Master Sword. This is Fee, the spirit of the sword, a being as ancient as the blade itself, created by the goddess Hylia in the distant past. Before now, Zelda couldn't hear the voice within the sword. Only now that she is connected to the divine powers within can she hear the message, that Link can still be saved. Sheikah from Kakariko Village arrived moments after Link's collapse. Zelda wasted no time. She gave them the Sheikah Slate and ordered them to take his body to the Shrine of Resurrection, the healing facility she had helped to uncover. Link had held on to life by a thread, but his condition was so extreme that he would be held in stasis for a century to recover. Zelda knew what she must do. The princess took up the Master Sword and travelled to the Korok Forest, where she could entrust the blade to the care of the Great Deku Tree, trusting that one day Link would return to find it. She then made her way to Hyrule Castle, to face Ganon, alone. We don't know the details of what happened when Zelda fought the Calamity. We know the result. The princess vanished, 
seemingly imprisoned within the castle, inside the calamity itself. But Ganon was sealed. He was contained to the castle by the princess's sacred powers. This stalemate lasted for a hundred years. For the entire century Link recovered in the Shrine of Resurrection, Zelda kept the calamity restrained by herself. Link wakes up confused and alone. He has no memory of anything that happened before this. He knows his name, he's able to talk, but he doesn't know about Hyrule. He doesn't remember the champions, or Zelda, or the Calamity. In the sterile, ancient Shrine of Resurrection, he climbs out of a stasis tank and finds the Sheikah Slate, which had been stored there under Zelda's orders, and allows him to unlock the gate that sealed him inside. For the first time in a century, Link sets foot in Hyrule, a broken kingdom he cannot remember. On the Great Plateau, he meets with an old man, a wizened adventurer who claims to have been living there, in the wild, for some time. The old man explains that this Great Plateau was the birthplace of Hyrule. Though it now lies in ruins, the Temple of Time and the remains of an ancient town can be found nearby. A voice speaks to Link, instructing him to follow the Sheikah Slate and travel to a Guidance Stone near the plateau's edge. He does this, he places the slate into the pedestal, which rises into the air. The Guidance Stone was the top of a Sheikah Tower, built by these ancient people 10,000 years ago to act as sensors to detect the return of the Calamity. It had been buried, hidden from Zelda and her research teams, until the Calamity's return shook the Earth, uncovering the very top of this giant structure. By activating the Plateau Tower, Link sets off a chain reaction. Other towers rise from deep below the ground all across Hyrule, bursting through rock and ruin to point skyward. Not only this, but activating the Plateau Tower also activates the Sheikah Shrines, which, until now, had remained sealed and dormant. This was always the intention. The ancient Sheikah, with the foresight of the goddess, had designed the shrines as trials for the hero. They were built specifically for him, so that when he awoke after the Calamity, they would function as training facilities to refine the resurrected Link into a weapon capable of destroying Ganon. Here, atop the Plateau Tower, Link is again contacted by Zelda. Using her sacred powers, she's able to communicate with her chosen knight from within Hyrule Castle, where she continues to keep Ganon imprisoned but her strength is failing. Under the instruction of the old man, Link adventures across the Great Plateau, finding and completing trials set for him by the ancient Sheikah. In doing so, he unlocks powers on the Sheikah Slate, Magnesis, Stasis, Cryonis, and Bombs. At the end of each shrine, he breaks the Stasis field around a Sheikah monk, each of whom has remained in a meditative state for over 10,000 years. By completing their trial, Link frees their spirit, and is rewarded with a spirit orb, a symbol of his courage. As the monk's trials are set in the name of the goddess Hylia, these spirit orbs are offered to the goddess statues found across the kingdom. A particularly impressive one is found in the ruined Temple of Time, where Link again meets with the old man. The hooded figure explains that Link has lost his memory, and reveals his true identity. He is the spirit of King Rome, 
the last king of Hyrule. Under Zelda's instruction, his ghost has remained on the plateau, watching and waiting for the return of the hero, in order to guide Link when he awoke. The King's Spirit explains the fall of Hyrule to Link, and tells him to meet with Impa in Kakariko Village, to the east. He provides him with the Paraglider, a device of Rito craftsmanship that allows one to glide on the wind, then fades away, his last duty to his kingdom finally complete. Link travels through the wilderness that was once Hyrule, and meets with Impa in the Sheikah village. The Shadow Folk are longer lived than Hylians, but after a hundred years, Impa is old, and has served as Kakariko's chief for many years. She, too, notes that Link has lost his memory, and explains to him the legend of 10,000 years ago, when the ancient Sheikah's divine beasts had helped seal the calamity away. She tells him of the fate of the divine beasts, and that, to defeat Ganon now, he needs to purge them of his malice and bring them back to Hyrule's side. It seems that the Calamity's power has been growing since his imprisonment a century ago. Ever since, a time known as the Age of Burning Fields, he has remained largely dormant, except for the Blood Moon, an event where his power surges and any of his slain minions are brought back to life. Most of the Guardians were destroyed by Zelda a hundred years ago, but many still remain active, in particular those that lurk in the shadow of Hyrule Castle, which in recent times has become more dangerous. Adventurers used to sneak into the castle to hunt for treasure, but not any longer. Since the Calamity's imprisonment, the Divine Beasts had laid dormant, but now that Zelda's hold on the beast was beginning to weaken, they have started to move once again, still poisoned by Ganon's control. Zelda had telepathically woken Link up from the Shrine of Resurrection just in time. She had held the Calamity for a century, but any longer and her powers would fail. With this, Link's main quest begins. Alone, he ventures through the vast, lonely kingdom, through a world whose people cling to life in the ruins. By visiting places where he had been in the past, he is able to unlock memories of his life before the Calamity, restoring memories he had lost of the Champions, and of Zelda. Link travels to the homes of Hyrule's main races, with the goal of freeing their divine beasts from the blights that seized them. Zora's domain still mourns the loss of their princess a century later. Unlike the other races, whose shorter lives mean that few remain who still recognize Link, the Zora are extremely long-lived, and thus many still remember the Hylian champion. Some, like Muzu, blame the Hylians for the Calamity, for allowing Mipha to die a hundred years ago. But the Zoras are in desperate need of a Hylian warrior. Their divine beast, Varuta, possesses the ability to create an endless supply of water, and now that the machine has returned to life, controlled by Ganon, it threatens the area with floods. The only way to subdue the beast long enough to gain access is with shock arrows, but as the Zora are weak to electricity, none of them can wield them. King Darifan, Mipha's father, agrees to let Link help, and together with Mipha's brother, the now gigantic Prince Sidon, the hero disables and boards Varuta. The Divine Beasts are gigantic engines, full of churning gears and pistons that move their bulking mass around. They are the pinnacle of ancient Sheikah engineering, but now malice chokes them. Ganon watches from a thousand sinister yellow eyes, and even the defensive Guardian Scouts within have been turned to his side. Link needs to reach terminals inside the beast and interact with them with his Sheikah Slate, eventually unlocking the central terminal, the Divine Beast's main control unit. This is the heart of the Divine Beast, and it is where Ganon's power was focused. Link reaches out with his slate to activate it, but a dark cloud seeps from within. Sheikah energy and malice combine to once again form a phantom of the Calamity, 
Water Blight Ganon, the foe that had killed Mipha a century ago. The incomprehensible horror that Ganon had become, the Feral Calamity, is a being formed from malice, an evil energy that holds his consciousness. The Blights are all Ganon himself, shards of the Calamity sent to slay the champions and take their beasts. But Link is able to do what Mipha could not. Though Water Blight Ganon is immensely powerful, wielding a formidable energy spear and powerful ice magic, the hero defeats it, finally purging the scourge of Varuta and completely ousting Ganon's influence from the machine. In doing so, he frees the spirit of Princess Mipha. When the champions died, their suffering did not end. They all remained, trapped as spirits within their beasts. They were forced to watch Hyrule burn from inside these war engines, helpless to stop it. Mipha explains that, the day before Link arrived, she had almost given up hope, almost resigned to her fate to exist here, as a spirit for all eternity. She grants Link the power of her healing magic, so the hero always carries her spirit with him, to soothe his wounds and even to save him from death. Link travels through the wilderness to Goron City on Death Mountain, to Rito Village in the Northwest, and to Gerudo Town in the desert, each tormented by their own renegade divine beasts. Varudania circles the summit of Death Mountain, causing eruptions that make mining the mountain almost impossible. Varmado patrols the skies, clipping the wings of the Rito below it with the threat of its powerful cannons. And Varnaboris stalks the desert, threatening any that get too close with lightning and powerful sandstorms. Like with the Zoras, Link is accompanied by a member of each race to board their divine beasts. Yonobo, the grandson of the mighty Daruk, finds the courage to escort Link to Rudania. Tabor, a Rito whose skill with a bow is matched only by the legendary Rivali, helps the hero soar into the skies above and subdue Mado. And the Gerudo chief Riju, a descendant of Urbosa, rides alongside Link to fight Naboris. But only after Link proves himself to the tribe by recovering the legendary Thunder Helm from the clutches of the Yiga clan, defeating their leader, Master Koga, in doing so. The hero ousts Ganon's malice from each of the beasts, breaking the Blight Ganons and, one by one, freeing the trapped spirits of the champions. Like Mipha, each of them grants Link their signature ability, Daruk's protective shield, Rivali's wind gust technique, and Urbosa's powerful lightning storm. Though they lost their lives a century ago, the spirits of the champions are now able to control their divine beasts. They each move their machine to a vantage point with a direct sight of Hyrule Castle, readying themselves for Link to signal for the final strike. Across Hyrule, Link continues to discover ancient Sheikah shrines and prove his worth to the monks within. With each spirit orb he gains, he recovers a piece of the strength he lost a century ago, slowly reforging himself into Hyrule's hero. It's because of this recovered strength that, when he arrives in the Korok Forest, he's able to pull the Master Sword from its pedestal once again. Since Zelda left it here during the Great Calamity, the Blade of Evil's Bane has been healed. The Deku Tree's sacred power has rid the Sword of Malice, and it once again glows with the light to repel evil. With the sword that seals the darkness in hand, and the Divine Beasts at his back, Link is now ready. He is the Hero of the Wilds, more powerful than ever before the warrior destined to free the land from Ganon's chokehold. Link finally makes his journey to Hyrule Castle, for a final battle a hundred years in the making. In the sanctum of the castle, the throne room from which King Rome and his queen once ruled, 
Link sets eyes on the Calamity. The castle itself is swarmed by a snake-like phantom of Ganon, a dark cloud of malice that swirls around the structure like flames. But this isn't the Calamity's true form. In the Sanctum, a cocoon hangs from the ceiling. Ever since Link's resurrection, Ganon has been regenerating a physical form, but it is incomplete. Link arrives before the Calamity has prepared itself. But even still, its power is too much for Zelda to bear. Her voice echoes from inside the cocoon. She cannot hold him any longer. The Calamity is free. With Sheikah laser beams, Ganon cuts itself out of its cocoon and drops to the stone floor. The impact smashes through the base of the Sanctum, and Link and Ganon fall into a hidden chamber, down through an ancient tunnel and into an astral observatory room built by the Sheikah in the distant past, found somewhere in the very heart of the castle. Here, we finally see what Ganon has become. This incomplete form resembles the Blight Ganons. It, too, is a fusing of Sheikah parts like Guardian Legs, Blades and Cannons, and Malice, the dark energy of Ganon. On its head, it wears a crown, resembling that once worn by the Gerudo, Ganondorf, and a beard of flaming red hair hangs below. The Calamity Ganon is little more than Malice itself. It has no physical form. Its origins are unknown. Only because of the Sheikah technology that surrounded it when it awakened was it able to pull together this nightmarish body, a desperate attempt to form something that could defeat the hero destined to stop it. But Link isn't alone. Together, the spirits of the champions launch their attack and order their divine beasts to fire on Hyrule Castle. Four giant beams of pure, sacred energy flood the Sanctum, rushing down into the observatory and critically wounding Ganon, as they had intended to do a hundred years before. Ganon screams, but he isn't dead. As they have done since time began, the hero and the darkness begin their duel. Fireballs and lasers singe the air, and the Master Sword clashes with Sheikah blades deep below the castle. Even in an incomplete form, the Calamity is monstrously powerful, but so is Link. He has with him the spirits of the four champions. He's able to move the wind like Ravali, to create a defensive shield like Daruk, to summon lightning like Urbosa, and even to return from death with Mipha's healing magic. Slowly, but surely, the sacred power of the Blade of Evil's Bane chips away at the Calamity, until, finally, its Sheikah body collapses. But Ganon wasn't done yet. Again, the Calamity is a being of pure malice. The Sheikah technology that gave him form was just a means to an end, a way to piece together a physical body to combat the hero. Malice was its true form, and while Malice remained, the Calamity endured. Zelda's sacred powers teleport Link out into Hyrule Fields, where the remaining Malice rushes together into a storm. The princess's voice sounds out. She explains that Ganon was born out of a dark past, that he is the embodiment of the ancient evil that is reborn time and time again. Out of utter refusal to give up on reincarnation, the Calamity's malice solidifies into one final form, Dark Beast Ganon, a titanic boar formed from the purest hatred. Zelda entrusts Link with the Bow of Light, a weapon that, like the Master Sword, harnesses the sacred power to repel evil. She says that, though Link may not be at a point where he has recovered all of his memories, courage need not be remembered, for it is never forgotten. The final battle begins. 
On horseback, Link weaves past the deadly beams of malice conjured by the Dark Beast. But even the sacred Bow of Light cannot penetrate Ganon's defense. Only when Zelda, with the last of her power, creates glowing weak spots in its armored body can Link damage the beast. Only when the princess and the hero work together can the calamity be countered. Eventually, Ganon is weakened to the point where a giant malice eye opens up on its back, the very core of its being. Link jumps from his horse, and time slows around him. He holds his breath, and sends one final holy arrow into the heart of the Calamity. The Dark Beast roars and recoils in pain. Suddenly, a golden light bursts from inside it. Zelda. She had remained inside the Calamity itself for a century, a splinter inside him that held his evil powers back. Now she is free once again, her sacred powers fully awakened. Even faced with this terrifying, ancient evil, Zelda remains calm. Her power strips Ganon of its final form, returning it to a snake-like phantom made from what malice remains. It weaves through the sky, roars, and lunges back down towards the princess, who holds out her hand. The mark of the Triforce shines out, and just like it had done at Fort Hateno, her sealing power explodes outwards, a sphere of golden light that destroys the Calamity, completely and utterly eradicating the last of the Malice. The sky clears as Ganon's power fades away. Finally free, Zelda stands in Hyrule Field once again, the wind running through her hair. She explains that she has been keeping watch over Link all this time, that she has witnessed his struggles and his trials in battle. Though he was faced with impossible odds, she says that she never doubted him. She always believed that he would find a way to defeat Ganon. She declares him the hero of Hyrule, then asks, Do you really remember me? With this, Breath of the Wild comes to a close, a story of the fall of a kingdom, and of hope rising from the ashes, ends with Link and Zelda reunited. Together, the pair stand at the gates of the ruined Hyrule Castle, what was once the heart of their kingdom, then turn away. But, floating among its spires, the spirits of King Rome and the Four Champions watch over them, Though they lost their lives, they witnessed the destruction of Ganon, and the return of hope to Hyrule. If the player has recovered all of Link's memories by this point, then there's an additional scene after the credits. Link and Zelda stand on a hill overlooking their kingdom, both in their travelling attire as they often had been a century before. Zelda explains that they will make their way to Zora's domain, where Divine Beast Varuta has stopped working. The princess wants to investigate the situation, but also to offer her condolences to King Darifan for the loss of his daughter, Mipha. Ganon is gone, but there's work to do. Zelda believes that, together, they can restore their kingdom to its former glory, or even beyond. She says that she can no longer hear the voice within the sword, that her sacred powers have faded. She's surprised to admit it, but she can accept that. She is finally free of the terrible burden her bloodline had bestowed onto her. Her kingdom no longer required her sealing powers, and Zelda is free to live how she chooses, as an adventurer and a researcher, traveling her kingdom with her knight. But as we now know, this peace didn't last. Breath of the Wild leads directly into Tears of the Kingdom, where Link and Zelda uncover a terrible secret deep underground, a secret that changes everything they know about Hyrule and about the Calamity. Though this Link and Zelda had been through more than almost any others, 
their journey was only just beginning. Thanks for watching this video. It's only one week now until Tears of the Kingdom. The wait is almost over. This video took a lot of work to get done on time, so if you enjoyed it, consider leaving a like or subscribing if you want to see more Zelda content. A huge thank you to my good friend Monster Maze, who provided the 3D maps of Hyrule used in this video. Be sure to check out his channel for some really high quality Zelda stuff. And as always, thanks so much to my channel members, including Myth Tier members, Selena Rose, Larry Farry, Zelda But A Girl, Lily, Pappy Chris, Rice Glight, Vampy Foot, Thomas Drury Wang, Celestial Kitsune, Monkey Gamer Z Official, and Gerudo Eli. Cheers guys, and I'll see you next time.